hot present moments that are in cause. In the meantime, I'll be reading up the instructions while waiting for the to be caught. <coughs> Please do not make any recordings till I the chair declare the meeting open. No smoking, sorry, in the, in the event of a fire alarm sounds, please make your way to the nearest fire exit and follow the instruction of the officers and fire marshals. The assembly point is across the car park. No smoking, smoking is not permitted in Mainside Fire and Rescue Authority buildings. Toilets. I'll locate it further along the corridor on the opposite side with the signs clearly marking each door. If you require the use of these facilities, please respect the conduct of business and return to the room without delay. Sorry, Leaving the meeting, you should be requested to have the meeting for any reason other than an emergency. You will be required to switch off any recording equipment and leave the meeting with all your belongings. Privacy, confidentiality. Request everyone present who has any items relating to personal, private, confidential, exemption information to ensure that the items are not on display until such time they may be required. Recordings inform all present that the proceedings of the meeting may be recorded. Request if any observers have any objections to being recorded and offer the opportunity to leave the meeting, are offered the opportunity to leave the meeting. Mobile phones, equipment, please switch to silence. Now announcements, I am the councillor, Ted Cunanel, the chair of this meeting, now declare the meeting open. direction. 29 slides, but don't worry, it, it won't take that long. So, I'll give you a bit of a story, a place about Wirral. Wirral population, 320,000 and growing uh, according to the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment. Nearly 200,000 people of work in age, 60 square miles, 25 miles of coastline, which gives it its own inherent risks. We've got around 65,000 over 65s in Wirral, probably more than any other district. And of those 65,000 people, 34% of these people, over 20,000, live alone. As you may or may not know, between a seven mile stretch between a male born in Birkenhead and a male born in Hesville, there is a 10 three year life expectancy gap. So there's polar extremes on the border of social deprivation and affluence. Uh, 7,000 businesses uh, which MFRS play a part in protecting. 
uh, provide an employer for about 105,000 people. Uh, councillors, will councillors in the room will tell you that there's more expansion planned for this is a Neptune development at New Brighton which has been extremely successful and the same Neptune group are looking at expanding into Birkenhead so again uh, the sprouts of growth are starting to show on Wirral so just a bit of a, a story of the place a map showing the locations of your fire stations in Wirral. Wirral is split into four parts of the council's drive under the ex-chief executive Greg Burgess was to split into the constituency areas. So you have Wallasey which constitutes six wards. Wallasey has about 90,000 people in that constituency. Birkenhead has six wards, that is about 88,000. And then in the red, if you can make it out, we have Wirral South. Whittle South, I'll just refer to it, it's about 72,000 people, and then Whittle West, and you will know Whittle West because we're going to get involved in further major consultation. So Whittle West has approximately 70,000 people. So that's the makeup of Whittle, and you've got your four MPs. So you've got Angela Eagle, Frank Field, um, Alison McGovern, and obviously Esther so that's how the boroughs split. Now what you will see is Whittle South has two fire stations, Birkenhead and Wallasey have one in each. If the proposed merger actually happens at Sugar Massey, where you can see the Morton West and Sugar Massey, you will actually end up on the boundary but you will have two fire stations in Wallasey constituency and none in the Whittle West constituency. Does that make sense to how we're going to have the differential? Now, when we move to mergers and we take West Kirby out of the equation, if that's to happen, we then have to look at how the remaining five stations cover the workload for your prevention and protection as well as operational response and who picks up around the different wards. Now, to add to some confusion of this, that's the ward breakdown, that's the constituency breakdown. Fire service, and it's not a great side, we've got six current fire stations. If you can make out the vague colours, our fire station boundaries do not map across to constituency areas or political wards. An example of this would be the green area in Upton actually crosses over nine political wards in Whittle. So Whittle has 22 political wards, 66 councillors, and Upton, quite a small footprint out of them all, covers nine of them. So it's something that obviously the area managers are, and, and the POs will pick up as we go, because when we take a fire station out, who is going to pick up that workload? So that's some of the, the geography of, of Whittle for you. This is some of the incident data. You will be pleased to know because of our continued campaigns and what we're doing on the district, as goes on in, in every other district to be fair, we've had significant reductions as opposed to last year. So if you work on the basis, Wirral probably attends, if you went back five years, the average would be about 3,700 incidents a year. If you go back about just three years, it's probably on average about 3,100 incidents a year. So this is an estimate for pretty much 2014-15, because we're not at year end, as the fiscal year doesn't end until the, the end of the month. But you will see the light blues. So accidental dwelling fires, accidental dwelling fires are down. There was a, a slight spike last year. But they are down. Unfortunately, and I must make this clear, there has been three fire fatalities in Wirral. There is one confirmed fatality that is in your report. Now it goes to the coroner for a post-mortem. <coughs> there was two outstanding. There has been another confirmed one, and then unfortunately we had one in Airby, I think it was in February, and the verdict is still with the coroner uh, to actually say what, what the cause of death was it is likely to be an accidental fire there. So there has been three in Wirral. 
So commercial building fires are down. We have a problem with deliberate vehicle fires. We've had a five-year, year-on-year increase in deliberate vehicle fires. I can assure you we are working with our police colleagues and it's on their radar about antisocial behaviour governance. There's a split between, if you like, unauthorised taking the most vehicles and kids burning them out to organised crime groups and using them as a threat. So <coughs> we are working with police colleagues to try and reduce those numbers. Uh, Anti-social behaviour fires, if you like your bonfire planet and your, your rubbish fires, which take up a lot of our resource and time, have significantly re uh, reduced from last year. Uh, false alarms because of your agreed policy and strategy. The fire crews aren't attending as many false alarms as they once did. Therefore, I can utilise our fire crew skills in more productive ways. What you will notice here, special service calls, that's pretty much take road traffic collisions out of it. Everything else that we don't go to. Floodings, uh, water rescues, etc, etc. But we seem to have a year-on-year -year increase in special service calls in Wirral. Now what I would put that down to is, because of our because of austerity and we're working closely together with our other blue light responders, and you may have heard of Jesse, the police and North West Ambulance Service are more aware of our capabilities. And we generally <coughs> get a lot of calls generated from other blue light services to come and assist them. But sometimes we're actually just standing by, we don't actually deliver the service. But it's something that we have to monitor over time, because if that is the same across all the other districts, that could be seen as, you know, not a waste of time because we're supporting colleagues, but it's just something that we have to monitor. Road traffic collisions, um, it's on the increase in Wirral, but they're the ones that we go to. The council and police go to, to a lot more than the fire rescue service. We will go to your entrapment, so your more serious ones. Uh, we've got a fast route, the M53, and yet again, last year, claimed a number of lives on, the, on that stretch of road. Uh, I sit at the Collision Reduction Group um, and there's been postcode sort of uh, lottery of RTCs in Wirral and around 80-90% of the collisions in Wirral are actually from people who live in Wirral. So we actually know the roads but we're still having the collisions. So if you like, we deliver a lot of education to 17 to 25 year olds police will enforce and the council will engineer. But again, we sit very closely together and we monitor this on a, on a quarterly basis. Again, that's just your breakdown of what is a particular problem for time and resource for fire service assets. Well, again, this represents roughly 3,000 calls. This large chunk is ASB fires. So, predominantly, Birkenhead and Wallasey, because it's got the higher populations, it's also got the most social deprivation. 75% of our incident time is spent in those two wards. But, I'll caveat that with the next slide. If you like, these are those two wards where you'll see heavy mapping around accidental dwelling fires. But, the majority of fire deaths aren't in the traditional socially deprived areas that you may see in Liverpool. What you've got here is a mid wirral corridor of fire deaths. Now, when we look at the analysis of this, it's over 70s have been a majority of uh, fatalities, people who live alone, but also what you've got is a number of middle income people who live alone who either smoke or drink when they're coming over work. So they're not on benefits or socially deprived, but what's happening is they're coming home and for whatever reason, drink, smoke, smoking, uh, we are having a number of fatalities in that age category, and that's 40 to 49 year olds. So what am I doing about it? Because that's what I get paid to do. We're doing a lot of work with Cheshire and Wirral Partnership and a lot of work with health in Wirral. And also keeping one watchful eye on what's just gone on in Manchester with the devolution of six billion pound. But St. Cass is where the Cheshire and Wirral Partnership is. And they've referred uh, a lot of their clients 
through information chain agreements with strategy and planning so we can target our resources to the right people. So people who have actually registered onto programmes with Cheshire and Wirral Partnership, they have passed the data securely to our teams in strategy and planning and the fire crews are actually going out to these right people. So I'm not wasting my resources just walking up and down streets, knocking on doors. We are actually being very targeted driven in Wirral. That partnership with CWP is, uh, has expanded because Wirral are now on the fire service is sitting on the health and wellbeing board and a lot of the hospitals are coming on board around <coughs> sort of discharges from hospital especially vulnerable elderly people and so we're getting referrals direct from the hospitals as well so we can go out but again older people fatalities we work with the safeguard and adults board but again mid-range middle-aged people who live alone so we can't take the focus off them as well so they're the two strands that we're working towards to reduce fire fatalities um, <coughs> Again, I'd like to come in and say we have no fatalities, but I wouldn't lie, it's three this year. Cross-cutting strategies, um, as with every other district, the districts share information between themselves. Your group managers in, either, in each of our districts will, will sit at similar groups. In Wirral, we strangely have a different name for the same group, but we just confuse the issue by calling it something different. An example would be troubled families in some areas we've called it Intensive Family Intervention Programme in Wirral. So, main partners, I speak a lot with police and we look at the crime, uh, uh, police crime commissioners, crime and uh, plan for 13, 17. Public health, we are working very closely with public health in Wirral now because the public health uh, sector has a lot of information on vulnerable people on their books already. It's how we can get that data securely and safely. And again, one of our biggest partners is the council because we work hand in hand in glove. And that is, a stress. that is the same in each of our districts. So partnerships, this is a bit, a bit of a checks and balances for me. You can't read this, but you can see by the volume of partnerships we're in, we are heavily embedded within the partnerships in Wirral. So, is it worth doing all the, the work upstream, which I think it is, where we uh, put people into the partnership meetings? Because then, if we're involved in the partnership and seen as a key partner, which we are in Whittle, we get the benefit downstream. Some of the uh, analogies around have just showed you that a reduction this year in the number of fires. That way, that doesn't just happen overnight. It takes a lot of work. So what we have is, as well as our boots on the ground staff, some of their time, rightly I think, is spent working in the partnerships. They might not actually be boots on the ground, they might have to attend the meeting, but we monitor that we're not just going to meetings for meetings sake. So that's where your Wirral management team, what groups, and that covers a broad brush of partnerships in Wirral, and this is the numbers of uh, partnerships that we work with. All contribute to our Wirral Community Safety Plan, which will be published probably in the next week or so. Why do I do that as well? Is because we generate a lot of funding in Wirral for our own interventions. Now, I work for Mayor South Wales, I so don't work for the ambulance, I don't work for the council, but there are joint priorities. So if it fits with what I'm trying to achieve, We've got officers embedded in each of the local partnership boards and they bring in funding. Over the last three years we've probably brought in for different interventions, initiatives, roles around a quarter of a million pound. That is not our core business, that's on top of what we do already. So this year, again with austerity, my team, because I have a fantastic team who work in Wirral, Lots of discretionary efforts, they brought in around £55,000 from partnerships across Wirral. So, is it worth putting some of those people into those meetings? Well, I would say the evidence is there to suggest that is the right thing to do. 
what we do in Wirral, how do we take a national campaign, if you will all see now that we're going into check your smoke alarm, you know, spring forward, clocks go forward. Well, if we look at the fire kills calendar, that's the national spectrum across the UK. Then we have our own seasonal activity of what goes on in Wirral. And as I say, this is duplicated in each of the other districts. So, fire kills theme smoking. So what we will be doing in those areas. April is a usual one because the kids come off school for the first time really after Christmas. Generally gets dry and we all get hit for grass fires if there's a dry spell. So it's something we've learned over time. So we put seasonal plans in place. The obvious one is, is bonfire planning. It comes, we know it's in November every year. So how do we then take a national campaign Put it into a local campaign, how do we get it driven into the stations to ensure they're delivering what the districts want them to do. But we have monthly campaigns in Will, so we divide it up between the, the stations, the watches, the watch managers, and we give them freedom. We give them the parameters to say, that's the national campaign, this is the seasonal plan, over to you, what are you going to demonstrate for us? And so they take it upon themselves. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll go through a few photos in a minute to actually reassure you that we are doing what it says on the tip. So preparedness, this is where I was messing about with some of the PowerPoints. I found new skills that I never had. So you might start with it here at the end of you. Some of the big risks uh, in Wirral, and you may not know Wirral, 53, you've got the tunnels, you've got a lot of the docks now that are getting developed. Camelage, huge risk, we get the big ships in, we've got the huge wind farms getting built. And this is a picture taken from Tramia looking down, socially deprived area, lots of fires in Tramia's area, and some of the you know, private landlords around that, unscrupulous, but uh, we are working with the council about a private landlord scheme. Ferries, Stena Line, we've got the, uh, the Roro. Very similar to Liverpool, just on the other side of the water. Tramir Oil Terminal, for your information, the <coughs> biggest tank at Bunsfield, and you'll all remember Bunsfield, fits inside the smallest tank at Tramir Oil Terminal. That's on your doorstep. And Tramir Rovers, because they, it used to be a crowded place once, but it, it's not anymore. And also, as well as the, uh, the response element, We've also got our prevention and our protection teams. And we start planning in June for the bonfire season, which obviously starts around October time. So we work hand in glove, operational and green, but it's a team in Will, and that's how we work it. <coughs> Response, obviously, you'll see boys and the girls on the red fire engines. They go out day in, day out, they respond to incidents. And we have a really high record of meeting our attendance times in Wirral. So RTCs, house fires, and also being out there representing yourselves in the community. And then what we do in the community, unfortunately we've had some of your you know, fire fatalities this year. So we go out and we provide reassurance out in the community following any event. Although it's a very sad occasion, People do take that reassurance that the fire service do care and we go out and we give information and we fit smoke alarms and we reinforce our safety messages. So we also have now started, remember I said 65,000 people in Wirral are over 65 and I'm not saying everybody because my mum used to work for fire service, I couldn't say everybody over 65 has dementia but what I'm saying is it is a large proportion of our population. So the fire service are going into your health providers and providing fire awareness training and reciprocal the health are coming in to the fire service about if you go into somebody's home would you be able to have these questions? If somebody gave you this problem would you know where to sign and post them? So it's a reciprocal arrangement around the community. The spin-off for this one is the fact that the firefighters are getting the information about alcohol awareness, drug awareness, dementia, and some of them are taking it back to their families. So again, the training is reciprocal in will. 
and this is to just reassure you as well, the fire stations are truly getting involved in the community. So you've got Upper Bromborough, Trailblazers, lots of young people, funded by Wirral South constituency, going out, going out into Wales, and this is the time given up by our own staff. You know, to, these are kids in NEAT, you're the acronym for NEAT, so they're out and we're getting them back onto the job front. We work with the Police and Crime Commissioner about to stop hate crime. Unfortunately, Wirral has a high percentage of domestic violence out of all the districts. I work with police around that, and the Police and Crime Commissioner funded us to put the message around stop hate onto our fire engines, which we did gladly. Christmas Open Day, are you ready for this, Councillor Stapleton? <laughs> but in Birkenhead, you know, there's a difference, I say it's polarised, so in Birkenhead, at Christmas we did like a family event. It's not a gimmick, because we have other providers come in. We've got a troubled families team. So we do a Christmas event and we bring people in. We invite Father Christmas, obviously supported by all four of our councillors. You know, I've lost a bit of weight since then. Father Christmas. <laughs> but, but that's what we do. But it, it draws people to the fire station. You know, it's a community hub. But also, demonstrates RTC messages. It fits in with the police and their drink drive campaigns. But we don't just do it in Wirral, uh, in Birkenhead, we do it up in Heswell. The clientele in Wirral is slightly different. So up in Heswell, older people, so we had Live Well, and we supported here by the Heritage Centre, so we have the NHS in. So people are getting involved all on all stations. We have our heartbeat gyms that people are recovering from cardiac arrest on the stations. And one of the good things we did last year, we actually got the Prince's Trust up and running in Wirral for the first time. So, again, lots of commitment by our own staff. So, you know, we all have our moans and groans about austerity. What I can, again, reassure you is, on the stations, it is happening out there. People are putting their efforts in. Excellent people, just very simple. We had the Mayor, uh, we do a Troubled Families event and seek them around Mischief Night and we attract a lot of population in there. ASB has reduced in that neck of the woods at that time of year. We're out in the schools, we're in a day at the fire station. This was bonfire planning to young people because we have very young and youth. And then we had, uh, this was the British Lung Foundation, one of our own firefighters, one of his family members suffers uh, from a cancer and what he did, he, he asked if he could use the fire station to generate a breakfast, so he had members of the public coming in. So, in a whistle stop tour in about 20 minutes, again, performance encouragingly has re sort of reduced and we are at levels that are predicted. We still have three fire deaths and I can't get away from the importance of we want to aim for nil. But what we were doing is the team goes out day in, day out, and as I say, the whole Wirral are out there every day. And without doing all that, without having that district sort of support, we won't be getting the results we're getting now. So, I'm sorry it's been so fast that we we'll probably spend uh, a lot more time doing this. Uh, <coughs> so, I'll, question? Oh, oh. No, with the Wirral. It's a population higher than national average, and they've also had 26 fatalities over the last 10 years in the world. Yeah. Is there any way we can put more resources to the pensioners? Because these obviously the, the aging population, aren't they? Yeah. Is there any way we can, because I reckon that's where you've got that down there. Yeah, and it's a good point here. What, we, what we've done, we've been out to the same level to partnership board, and we're doing the data sharing agreements with them. We're, Again, we're working with help to try, if you like, it's like trying to find some needles in haystacks. So it's, if we can actually get the location of people, some of the work we're doing with Cheshire Wirral Partnership, which is thrown up an unintended consequences, we know the address of the people, we know that they're a priority status, they live alone, they're all within a hospital. The trouble is we can't get through the door. So it's, Right, okay, well we know this person lives here. We can't break the door down, so how so we have to go back to the health provider and say, when is the key worker going in? 
and arrange that we go, but that takes time. Obviously, I'm impatient because what we need to be doing is putting the interventions in place. And again, a good thing that went on this year was around healthier homes. And we were going out and giving uh, bedding packs away, some of the warm clothing, and we were unable to get people to refer. It wasn't just like you had to know somebody. We were getting referrals in from neighbours concerned, and we try and get that message out, but I agree, we need to keep trying to be more for vulnerable. And we are at working with all the partnerships that we have a very good links with the older people's parliament in West Whittle. They have a distribution list of 10,000, which we've used lots of times. But as I say, there's 65,000 uh, people of that age in Whittle. But hopefully next year, I can come back to the same group and give you a better performance figures. <coughs> Any questions? Um, Paul, you mentioned about that little cabinet about that. I reckon there are people are really hard to reach because they're not on anybody's uh, radar, they're not vulnerable person. So how do you reach people? What we did with the last chief exec, <laughs> that was the dilemma I, I, I was sat with Councillor Stapleton. So the giveaway to me was the live alone. So we went to Willowborough Council and said, would you do us a favour? Would you share you know, your single person council tax? You know, who are those people on that list? And Whittle shared that with us. So straight away it went from 320,000, it shrunk it down. I think it was a I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it went from a global figure to a manageable figure. And that goes on. On the fire stations, they'll have a gold mine system in status reports. So if it's, for instance, Paul Murphy, if I'm 65, I live alone, I'm a known smoker, I've been in hospital, I will build up a criteria, a vulnerable person index, and then what the fire crews will do, they will prioritise those people, especially if you have another visit. Slightly different because we got all the data of this middle corridor people, but as you say, they're not on benefits, they're almost hidden from sight. So we had to then sort of prepare a list of what information we had on people who were unknown to us. And they weren't in the high risk or the old high risk areas. They weren't in the low risk, they were in the middle ground. And again, that is quite labour intensive of, if we're prioritising older people, how do we sort this middle corridor out? So it's, again, working with CWP around the drug and alcohol misuse, so we'll target those people first. Um, and again, they don't share information and say, you know, Mr. Mayor, if he likes a drink, or Mr. Mayor, if he does. it's sanitised data, but it gives us a starting point and manageable figures away from 320,000. But it is difficult. Uh, touch wood, and I don't like saying it, of that category, we've had nobody this year. So something seems to be working for us. Yeah, thanks Paul. I mean, it's really good work that goes on with, uh, as it does all over the county, clearly, and particularly in the, the data sharing, I think, I mean, that clearly holds it in, isn't it, and tells us the people that we, we need to target. Um, and and I, I remember it's quite a while ago now, I think it was, it was where actually that pioneered the first sharing of data with adult social care, um, you know, it's grown from there, so it, it's fantastic. Um, just, just on the sharing of data issue as well, just wondering, do we actually share data or do they share with us more importantly from the utility companies? Because a couple of summers ago we had major problems with United Utilities in my own ward and there was no fresh water at all. The companies were just randomly knocking on doors and you know, trying to find people. They didn't even think to come to the fire service and it was sort of not necessarily me, but councillors who sort of knew, well, Mrs. Sonsa lives there, she's probably not known to any group, but she lives alone, you know, they clearly must have information as well, you know, water people, gas people, electricity people, I just wonder whether or not at some point they could be included um, as partners, because they were, they had no idea, basically, they said they had a vulnerable persons list, United Utilities, but it was just a waste of time. I'll, I'll pick that one the challenge for us is about bringing in data that we can manage and we can manage effectively. Um, and 
we are leading the What is, what, what is significantly important is the fact that well, actually we only vary one primary data sets. So Paul describes two of the kind of very key factors for us around the kind of facts on the People who are over 65 and people who live alone. Now, if the fire rescue services across the UK were to just adopt that simple data kind of set and apply that and target their resources, then we would see the fire deaths reduce significantly across the UK. As we get cuter and cleverer about the kind of information that we hold and then how we apply that, then you were able to apply or overlay different data sets. So you take you know, people over 65, you overlay that with you know, people who live alone, you would then overlay with people who are you know, adult social care, so have mobility difficulties or are part of the care package, then start to hone it in even further and target it in, in even more detail. Now we haven't to this point used and applied the data from we are not confident that we can rely on it to actually be useful. In the same way as you know, we have information from RSLs, so social landlords, which is fine, but it doesn't help in the target of those really vulnerable individuals because actually a lot of tenants and properties are well maintained, we have smoke alarms, they are occupied by families and not necessarily the properties that we would want to go into. So whilst you know, we would target them at certain times in our campaigns, wouldn't necessarily be confident with the person specific um, interventions that we would want to put in place. But the more information we get, so the likes of them including something around smoking, so those individuals who smoke, we start to say people over 65, people who um, live alone, people who are part of you know, part of that social care, people who smoke, all that is part part of that from the person that sees, then that does hold us into the car that top end of the pyramid of, of vulnerability there and so we are very selective on the data and the credibility of the data that we bring into the service um, and we are working nationally and Deb are part of the kind of team who have, who have picked it up from a national perspective now but our data share on a wider, wider scale um, and it's a data share with the NHS in, in, in the first instance. So you know, to, 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 to answer your, your question, Councillor Rennie, Yes, we would share that information, but we do hold that information because we use our mobile data terminals at an operational instance to say, right, okay, here's, a, here's the form of the people in this community. So if there's widespread flood, <coughs> a, a power outage, we would be able to work with those utility providers and say, these are the properties that you would want to visit in the first instance to check on the welfare of people and in your properties which we know they are vulnerable. So whilst we use it to target our home safety intervention, you can also extend that to an operation kind of context and use it on scene to make sure that the people that are not on phase are people who are most in need of, of, of rescue or, or, or being made safe. So, you know, but we don't necessarily draw that information from the utilities at this moment in time because of its credibility and its strength because of not being primary source of data that we can rely on. And I don't ask this question in any way to criticise really, but just talking about the station grounds and the number of incidents that the appliances from those particular stations go to. On recent visits around fire stations, and I mean, you know, we've had them all across uh, uh, society, but uh, particularly there were some of the questions that were raised when we were talking to firefighters, um, particularly because there's the issues regarding the, the possibility of a merger. And um, some of the firefighters were saying to us as members, well, some of the information that we get and um, put before us really, you know, they would they would say we couldn't basically rely on 100% because they were um, mentioning that on a number of occasions um, from one particular station they've been out doing home fire safety checks um, on their area and they've seen an appliance from another area actually dealing with a fire within where they, they thought that they should have been actually um, seconded out to. Um, now, I quite understand, you know, that we send the nearest possible appliance to it, but I, I think there was, you know, from firefighters, you know, and whether it's right, whether it's not, I have no idea, but they, they did seem to have a perspective that perhaps some of the fire stations, um, and 
talk about we're all water, I suppose, the same could be said anywhere um, by firefighters. Some of the stations um, that which are looking pretty quiet are probably because, in their words, not mine, um, some of the fire stations were a home for closure, not this particular one, I have to say, and therefore, you know, they were sending appliances from other stations. Um, and I was very uncomfortable with it, and they said, well, how do you scrutinise that? And I said, well, clearly we have the facts and the figures in front of us, and I believe what I've seen in front of me. But I suppose if I was challenged outside by some, you know, somebody, or we were in, you know, had an internal inspection from the government, and they said, well, how do you scrutinise it? It would, it would stand up as a pretty weak answer to say, well, I believe, you know, what's put in front of me, really. So, um, as I say, I feel a bit uncomfortable asking it, but I did promise the crews on the fire stations we would ask really, and is there any way, you know, there could be perhaps a drilling down of some of the data that, that we receive? I mean, we, we get lots of it, and I'm not asking for more really, but just so that we as elected members could be comfortable that we're basically just not believing all that's put in front of us. And I have no reason to say I'm not believing if you understand where I'm coming from, but just to answer that question. That's fine, that's it. And, and certainly we can have someone from um, our fire control come and provide some information to the form of the school. Let me even reassure you absolutely categorically that that is not true. No, that's right. what I believe. Yeah. Now, what, what we've got to bear in mind is people have long memories. And so what I would describe to you is maybe some historical um, operational response. So in the past, we, we had a um, small fire strategy we had forty two appliances we were able to facilitate it and we would send appliances that weren't there to primarily save life so we could protect the likes of Hezwell because it had one fire appliance so we wouldn't know that that appliance and we would keep it on that station area to respond to life risk and so if we had two appliances elsewhere Berg Head say that appliance from Berg Head would mobilise into Hezwell's area to deal with a small fire we were maintaining that operational immediacy and response for life was during that period. That is now historic, but we haven't got that luxury anymore. Uh, we've got only two fire stations in Merseyside, as you well know, that have got two appliances, one in Southport and one in Kirkfield, the other to the uh, operational resource centre. But people keep that kind of that, that memory of them. Well, actually, there were times when a fire engine was housed in Whiston Fire Station and a fire engine came from another area the fire out in the park across the road. That is absolutely true. But it's based on maintaining the, the you know the rescue pump yes. in Whiston's you know, station here. That is no longer the case. So you know, maybe you know, that is kind of a, a reflection back on what has happened historically. I can you know, tell members now categorically there's you know at no point in the last 12 months where a fire engine has been you know deployed where there's a fire engine closer to that thousands of fire engines are using the ABLS system, they are mobilised to the incident of the first and the closest fire engine is mobilised on each and every occasion. So, you know, it, it, it's probably the best way to describe it. Remember who wants it to someone from fire control to talk to them and to mobilise it you know, of, of, of resources and how they do it. And we welcome that. That's absolutely fine. What, what, I probably can't drill down for you because they haven't got the information to support it is the fact that we don't do that. So there's no evidence or information to say, well, yeah, this is why we've done it. We just don't do that anymore. It's a historic understanding that the firefighters on occasion will draw back on things that have happened previously and apply them more and more recently. And councillor anyone just around the prevention and protection aspects. And I make no apology for it is we'll keep Bromber and Upton was the uh, strategic tenant response station. Uh, but if it's demand led and we're doing a campaign in Birkenhead, then I will move Hairsville to utilise resources along with PMP staff into those for a limited amount of time to you know, deliver what we said we're going to do on a campaign. So we will utilise the fire engines. As we see fit, <coughs> it's never not been beneficial to those station areas because they already have appliances posted within them, and it's usually Bromber and Upton. But you know what? So what I think they're trying to say there's, there's a double-edged sword of this, and uh, that's explain that. But the P and D side of it is, I will move resources around to meet the demand 
and then they'll go back to their station. Because otherwise, it was to confine them to the, you know, when I've said there's 90,000 people in Wallace East constituency, and there's only 70,000, we may have done all those in Wirral West, I need now to focus on, on making that. So I've got to have you know, that room to maneuver some of my clients. Just to be sure that we are in both lives. I, can I just say I appreciate um, that clarification. I mean, it's what I believed. But as I say, if we go around fire stations, no point just getting you know grievances or comments from firefighters about just at least raising it. So, as I say, thank you for that reassurance. Robin, do you want to say something? Yeah. yeah. It was only a quick one. Yeah. Last year, in the presentation, I said about the people who were treating yeah. accessible, accessible yeah, I did, and uh, I was going to answer that one. On the bonfire plan, so we approached the uh, Woodham Council, it's quite difficult to sort of uh, annotate this one, but what, what it was, was there was contractual, Woodham Woodham Council were looking to then, I think it was Biffa, maybe uh, Council Rennie, or the Council of State, they were looking at putting a new contract in with Biffa. So at that moment in time, when I went back to them, I was saying about identification, uh, can we utilise you to do you know, some of the, the leafleting for us around bonfire planning? It wasn't the right time for Whittle Council because they, they were concerned with the issues around, we've had it in the past as an authority around cold calling, but that's not off the table for this year's bonfire planning and around the contract that Whittle Council have now put in with Biffa. So it's, it's ongoing that one. So I certainly took on board what you said and the first thing you did after me was go back to Whittle Council and say, I've had this idea, can we implement it? Yeah. But it, it was in the middle of a, of a contractual yeah. issue and the reissuing of the contract in Whittle. So but it, it's certainly something that I, I haven't lost sight of and I certainly will bring back to next yeah. year. We accept that report. Agreed. Can I thank Paul for an excellent presentation? Thanks very much. Thank you. Also, I can call now to the third in plan, third quarter, Jackie's done in this. service delivery or functional plan action points and again they're all, all in progress progressing well. Some will possibly roll over into next year, some may complete by the end of the year. A couple of highlights from them are one of our own strategy and performance, the PIPS, which stands for Planning, Intelligence and Performance System, went live on the 23rd of December for the district managers to input their district and station plans. This is now being extended and will cover projects and service delivery plans. 
corporate comms action point was to communicate the implications of budget cuts to stakeholders, both internal and external. And we can report in the third quarter the, Wirral, the first Wirral consultation and the Allison consultations were completed. An ICT functional plan action point was the rollout of iPads offices. Proof of concept has been complete and SMG initially trialing at the present. Fourteen KPIs met their target in quarter three. I will go into more detail in further slides. Three were within 10% of the target, eight failed to reach the target, and two are reported annually via the Equality University and the Crazy Indicators. Total number of fires, these are indicators which have performed on or above target. Total number of fires on Merseyside. Compared to quarter three last year, this year, say last year, I mean 13, 14 as opposed to 14, 15, there were 1,578 less fires in the quarter, up to quarter three. Primary fires, there were 219 less than the previous quarter of the previous year. Accidental dwelling fires, 130 less. We're attending life risk, risk incidents within 10 minutes on 96.1% of occasions. And there were 1,216 less deliberate accidental dwelling fires recorded in the previous year. And that did include the bonfire period. Within 10% of target, Deliberate non-domestic dwelling fires missed the target by three incidents. We had quite a lot of it, well actually we had 23 incidents at Old Course Prison and four at Walton Prison, all in Aintree's area. Um, automatic fire alarms, we continue to focus on the peace defenders, as you were. Performance indicates that did not meet the targets. This is where Thor and I start to cross over because it's covered a lot of what I'm going to say now. I'm going to cover fatalities on the next slide because sadly, obviously, it's, we've had quite a few this year so far. RTCs and related injuries are up this, this quarter. We continue to target under 21s because 25% of road traffic collisions include under 21s. And yet they only hold 12% of the driving licenses. So we do continue to, to target that. There's no pattern to the RTCs, they occur across all of Merseyside. You could probably say a little highlight would be St Helens and Newton who are those for some reason they seem to have a few more than anywhere else, but generally it's across Merseyside. Sickness continues to be a problem, however, looking up to the end of February we have slight improvements and the figure was actually 8.9. Fatalities and fires. Sadly, to December 2014, we'd had seven fatalities and accidental dwelling fires. And of them, four, four of the seven were over 80 years of age. Six lived alone, with five males and two females. There were three fires which included smoking materials, one being the least cigarette as the source. Again, no pattern, although there were no, no fatalities in those. Either. The two deliberate fire deaths were sadly mother and child and suicide. As Paul covered earlier, these are the risk factors that we look at when identifying people who are at risk of fire. Sadly, since Christmas, there's been three further fatalities. Again, all three of them were over 75. In fact, the youngest was 78. All were male and all lived alone. As yet, we've had no coroner's verdicts on any of them. So of the 10 fatalities to date, bearing in mind these risk factors that we use to identify, seven of the 10 were over 75, six over 80, nine lived alone, and if there's anything to it, the men were male. Four of them had carers. Three of the instances, as I said, involved smoking materials, one alcohol, and one drugs. I 
as I said earlier, the KPIs which are reported out will be the quality and diversity and the appraisals which will be found on the web. And that's it, it was only a brief report this time. Are there any questions? Could you just clarify a little bit when you said on the fact was called by an e-cigarette? Was it that the... It was the charger. The charger The charger itself. blue, yeah. yeah. Just, I mean, just to give you a kind of context, then I'm a particular example. We're class that was nice enough to go on the fire fatality. However, you can put it in if you want circumstances where that the, the charger discharges contents and set fire to an oxygen supply that was in the property because the individual had COPD. Uh, the individual then went and turned off his oxygen fire out and subsequently died as a result of breathing difficulties then not necessarily directly as a result of the accident on a fire. However, had you not had the fire, you would still be alive today, so we're classified that for ourselves. Uh, quite rightly in my view, as it was an accident to dwell on fire. But that means that this year it's likely we'll be recording 10 accidental dwell on fires, which is you know the first time we've picked up a first floor in a number of years now. And the difficulty I, I have with that, and clearly the, the target of the resources in the right places is absolutely what has been described by Jackie and by Paul is that's on the basis of having 130 less accidental dwelling fires. But 130 less accidental dwelling fires, across many sides, are about five minutes of the week, the East Coast, and period. And we are working you know, considerably with our partners, and we are conscious that you know, we have an aging population. That is, you know, that is a factor in, in regards to this. And, you know, and people are being, you know, the preferred option for individuals who are aging now is to remain in their own home. And again, that presents us with some, some challenges moving forward. We have to be cognizant of. And a focus for us in the future will be a multi extent in the kind of the reach of fire engine service. Because where our resources are diminishing, fire engines and firefighters, the number of health fire safety checks we are being able to undertake diminishes as a result of that. And now we need to kind of extend our reach into some of our partner agencies who can help us and support us deliver as many home fire safety checks and interventions as we have done previously. It will just be done in a different way and that will be the focus of the home safety strategy which is being refreshed and which we'll come back to as a way of the members uh, over the next you know, kind of few weeks really to be ready to go. Just need to support us on a new roadmap and we'll reflect some of the stuff that we are when you are screwed by as you know. I'd just echo what was said because I think you've got a strange situation where um, fires are coming down but you've got a, a small number but it's a significant number of deaths as well of a very clear profile. Um, but I, I'm not sure what more we can do about that, apart from what we've already discussed in some detail about trying to... I, I did wonder earlier if perhaps we couldn't even ask for some kind of self-refer, uh, some kind of campaign asking people to self-refer, if they think they need some support. Anyway, the ones I was more interested in asking about here were road traffic collisions. Um, and I just think in many ways, um, Perhaps our targets, they're all red. We can't meet these targets because the collisions have gone up. Um, and really, this is secondary work to the fire in many ways. It, it's fairly random in the sense that we're not going to every single collision. It depends on the nature of the collision. And I'm just wondering whether we maybe need to review the targets we are setting ourselves because in many ways we could forever not meet the target if that was a trajectory going up. Um, and also, if we could work with partners and other people to research, search the reason why we think these are going up, because they're going up massive, um, you know, and is it around the use of mobile phones in cars or what, uh, or is it an education thing that needs to happen? Um, two other questions, Chair, if you don't mind. Um, one around injuries, which again, we've got two um, red ratings for operational staff injuries on page 93 um, and incidents of critical 
training, and the other one I'd raise is on page 95. I wonder what more we can be doing to bring down uh, the sickness, which is still very high. And I think as everything else is pressured, you know, we've got less staff doing a lot more work. What more we can do to reduce that sickness, because it's, it's quite high by comparison with the organisations. In regards to the, to the RTCs and the bureaucratic relations, I think you, you, you're quite right around kind of the hard ability to influence the, the outcomes of some of the some of the incidents that we got attended. I think we've had these discussions you know, frequently at, at, at the front of the and we will revise the targets as a result of moving into you know, April 1st and then a new set of targets, which is always shaped by the, the trend analysis where it's done by the DELTS team. And so the, the target will reflect the change in dynamic there. Uh, however, we are you know, to continue to work around those you know, and go traffically and we're just now accessing Stat 19 data, which is the, the data held back at least for all incidents across the inside. I would point you up and we'll undertake the analysis of that because where we are targeting our interventions are specific cohorts of individuals, they are 16 to 25 year olds, and um, they are not necessarily the people who we are now responding to. Um, we've, 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 we know there's a fair number of those incidents are um, pedestrians, a fair number of those incidents are probably enough. They fit to the older age group of the people who are uh, finding it difficult to navigate around the roads of maybe sides, which is anything else. But we are, we are focusing our interventions on a specific target group. We need to know whether actually our interventions are working. We just we'll use Whittle as the example. The Whittle prevention teams have delivered package called suddenly from nowhere to all of the colleges across across the world. So we have hit all of the kind of the requests from the local authority and our partners. We are you know, working to educate young people. But if young people aren't where they will try to prisons of the care, we need to better understand that and then renegotiate the kind of the, the offer around what the fire rescue service can provide to its local authority, authority partners. So that, that is work in progress. So the target will be revised accordingly, um, but also we are doing the analysis to say, are we better investing our time and time along our food and our team somewhere else, um, or do we want to kind of continue to focus on um, young people, which is one of our quality objectives as well. Also, Phil, sorry to interrupt no, just on that one. Um, I'm wondering, do we need to really somewhere be stationed as well, what percentage it is of working time that is spent on them because if we are attending more accidents, um, the sense in which we need to be seen not just as fire and rescue but you know the rescue bit is thinking of as fire yeah. needs to be emphasised more. Absolutely a poll from our high chart data around the kind of number of incidents that we attend. We do go to as a significant as many road traffic collisions as we do to that in that profile is probably more excessive and probably rescue more people from a road traffic collision than we do from accidental dwelling fires. And we play that out quite frequently that we are no longer just a fire service, we are a fire and rescue service. And that even extends to some of the comments that Paul made around the special service. And we, we, we've talked in great detail previously about the relevance of the fire and rescue service and emphasise the point that we do other things. And you know, and even extend that to what we do around our special services. And some of those special services that we're attending are due to um, threats of suicide and the like, and so we are responding to some stuff which isn't necessarily attributed to the fire as we say, so I think we need to play that out and play out loud and play out and for individuals. In respect of the, the question around injuries um, for operational staff in particular and our training, um, you know, Air Manager Watson has responsibility for, for, for that particular area, and what we would, we would say is we are training more. Um, the fact that the more training you do, the more likely you are to take care of injuries. Why are you training more? Because I'm going to put more emphasis on that. We have focused on the work we've done over the last certainly you know, few years. But equally, when we reduce the number of acts, you know, automatic fire alarms, I'll come back to that point shortly, you know, when our crews aren't being taken away, they're being able to focus more intensively on prevention work and operational response. So it's no surprise that there are more injuries in the particular <coughs> field. Uh, because our training is more extensive than it's ever been and that's about we, 
ensure that then there's not the other going to make it mission, which is around so you can affect the firefighters. Sickness, I mean, we have seen some small you know, reduction in sickness absence, which is funny enough, and um, there's quite significant force um, and you know, coincides with the rollout of our conduct and capability training. That is being rolled out at this moment in time, and every um, frontline, first line manager is getting the, kind of the input around you know, a supportive response to uh, sickness absence rather than a punitive response that was currently held by the authority. And we are still, the jury is still out because the training hasn't been completed yet and it hasn't been introduced in the way that you know, it's fully embedded across the organisation. But our focus and our, our work is in that area is intensive and it is something that you know, the committee would need to kind of continue to monitor over the next 12 months absolutely to assure themselves that what we have put in place is starting to deliver against you know, some quite challenging uh, targets. Well, it would, it's not necessarily the assurance, it's a fairness, it's, um, it's just probably a kind of a, a recognition of uh, that. And so, you know, we shouldn't do too good unless it's being given to, it's specific about some of the finance research, but members will know that I spent uh, four days in London, part past their pay per view, and um, London Fire Brigade, but we've not had to change their name to Fire Rescue Service, but London Fire Brigade are facing the same increases in sickness absence as we have done over the period, and they're seeing the, the, the exponential increase in sickness absence. It is a real focus for us, um, and some of the things we are doing through case orders, the work on our you know, mental health, and so on and so forth, should underpin the capability, you know, the procedures that we're put in place, should provide support you know, to, to individuals, and you know, we will continue to monitor that over the next 12 months since introduction to service, and we would hope to see a decline in sickness absence levels. Chair, can I just raise going, going back to the health and safety? Um, it's not really clear within the numbers between um, the risk physical training and the actual um, operational injuries. Could it be possible to split it out? Because obviously we've got 26 days and 26 and you've done training or is there some been injured at incident so you should make it clear? It, if, I may, if you are happy to, we've you know, again managed an option to provide an annual report on our health and safety, which we consider more defined breakdown. You know, we can happily safely add that to, to members, or if you prefer to, again managed an option will come back and report on, on specific injuries to the next performance and screening meeting, whichever is more preferable. Yeah, I, I, I think it just needs splitting out so um, people can see clearly how many operational uh, <coughs> personnel have been injured on, on fire calls or incidents as to training because that could equate to 26 in training that have been injured. Yeah, but we, the members prefer that to be brought back to performance and scrutiny or, or that report exists so we can provide you with that level of detail. Um, we prefer that that come back to performance and scrutiny in our future meeting. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I bring it back up. Um, we're trying to split it up so yeah, fine. In, in a minute it, yeah. it clearly shows. It's just so it can be clear numbers. No, no problem, we can bring that back to the next performance group. Chair, can I just mention, because I think so much good work has actually been done about presenting all this information, and generally I think it's a really good story. That's it's just, um, I mean, focus down, because uh, where we've got red is not a lot. And it's very easy now for us to focus down. But like Anthony, I recognise, I think what's easier for us when we're reading a lot of information is numbers. Numbers are very good because we can see much quicker, can't we, what, what it is we need to know. Chair, sure, just make one additional comment that they'd say I would refer back to it. Uh, we talk about the uh, automatic firewall actuations and that, and that show us kind of as amber at this moment in time. We revised the target because we have four FA responses because we only have four months worth of data when the target is initially um, created. We've got now 12 months worth of data, so the target has been revised accordingly, which is in line with what we would do normally with sufficient amounts of information. But members may well recall that after the authority meeting um, on the 26th, members wanted us to bring back a report around automatic firearm actuation, the introduction of the policy and how that has impacted our performance. And whilst that is showing that um, our performance is 
massively improved and you know, I mean, a fire rescue system from that country who want to adopt the you know, our AFA policy as, as currently is. But I think if we get members of that intent, we'll bring that AFA performance and, and, and reflection on the kind of policy back to a future uh, performance and scrutiny committee. Okay, I accept that report. <coughs> Thank you, Jackie, for the uh, lesson. Thank you. Right, it's not to uh, item 5, which is just for the instance, 117 to 128. Thanks, Chair. The, I mean, the purpose of the report was to, to look at the impact on our response times for cross-border mobilisations of Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service uh, appliances. And you know, it's on the basis of the fact that we've reduced our number of appliances from 42 to, to 28 over the period. And, you know, and how that has impacted on our tenant response standards and whether you know, some of the response is going to that further. Um, as a result of that work, you know, we've, we've recognised that we have responded on 76 occasions on what we would describe as under Section 1316 agreements. And basically what that is is that we're assuring ourselves and our partner fire rescue services in the, the region that should they have a, a call and we are within proximity or closer to the incident than they are, and we would mobilise our resources. Or if it was a large contact of incident, we would mobilise resources into their particular areas to support them. And that reciprocal arrangement exists for Cheshire, you know, Manchester, Lancashire, deploying resources into Merseyside as well. As I say, we had 76 occasions when we deployed out of Merseyside into uh, our surrounding fire and rescue services, um, of which 43 requires to be involved in operational activity. Uh, 36 involved firefighting, six were road traffic collisions, and one was a rescue from height. 33 mobilisations did not require any assistance from us at all. Out of the 76 as well, 19 were attendances into Neston, and members will be aware that you know, that area is ceded to Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service because clearly from Heswell we are able to respond quicker than uh, Cheshire are currently, so it seems ridiculous that we would rely on Cheshire to respond when we provide a quicker response, hence the reason why there are 19 incidents uh, from that particular location. In addition to that, Merseyside only required assistance from our neighbouring fire and rescue services on seven occasions during 13 14. Six were from Lancashire to Southport, North Merseyside, and one was from Cheshire to a seeded area uh, of Cronton. In addition to the, the local the, the mobilisations under 13 16 arrangements, we've also deployed national, uh, nationally um, in regards to bigger UK wide issues and our urban search and rescue team, our high volume pump, our detection, identification, and monitoring vehicle, and they've been broadly responded to, like to flood response and, and, and undefined chemicals. We've done, we've done this on, on nine occasions during 13 uh, 14 and the, the incidents are generally more contracted, so we require um, a, a fair amount of time spent at that location, but it's only limited to nine occasions. And then members will also be aware that we were part of the USAR uh, assets were deployed to Bosnia uh, during May 14 to assist with flooding in that particular location. All you could potentially have an impact on our operational response for Fort Merseyside, but I would reassure members that performance within Merseyside again for tenor response time for life risks. Whilst has it, it has dropped marginally in the last three years from 98.2% to 91.7% over the period, it is still way in excess of the 90% target that would be you know, you know, that's quite challenging target and uh, comparing to the fire and rescue services that we set ourselves. So you know, we are performing well irrespective of the fact that we are using our assets to deploy both nationally and regionally to support all the fire and rescue services. So it's more of a, a reassurance than anything else. The legal implications and the reasons why we do that are detailed in, in paragraph 20 and 21 under the legal implications and the financial implications they are not you know, really, 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 really recognised the kind of maturity of the relationship from the regions between fire and rescue services where if we require their resources and they require ours, then we do that because that is what the public would expect of fire and rescue services rather than move the public money around uh, from what fire and rescue services are doing. And that's the kind of that's the, the basis of the, the recommendation 
to members is that the you know, members a scrutinise the information contained within the report, which provides evidence that Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service continues to support over the board's request, with the data demonstrating there is no significant um, information to indicate that this activity has affected our local performance indicators, and uh, or that ex officers to continually monitor over the board, over the board incidents to ensure this activity does not impact on that performance going forward. So, in effect, you know, performance isn't you know, unduly affected at the moment time, but we will continue to monitor that. And if we have concerns, we will bring that back, or members have concerns, we will bring that back to a future uh, committee meeting. Okay. <clears throat> Just one question, Chair. Uh, I can understand the uh, 76, which is a pro graph that could change at any time. Um, but as far as the national one's concerned, and you say there's no financial impact, does that mean whatever we send and whatever we do, wages, etc., equipment, that, that uh, somebody pays for it? That is correct. Yeah. The, 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 there are arrangements in place for those costs to be recovered for some basis that far as we say. But I think it goes without saying because we have fully trained up full time firefighters, we are probably going to become quite unique in a position to give that kind of support. But it is it strengthens our argument for having the fully trained up firefighters um, because he'll end up as the national response for the whole country. Things proceed as they go. Chair, yeah, yeah, any, any comments? Regards, you know, we've been mobilising a fair number of uh, times for national related issues that means the national models are something that's kind of described. Uh, and and then, you know, a fair amount of that is because we have professional staff who are equipped and competent against a whole raft of skill areas when I say safety and rescue. As I said, that's an art kind of issues that aren't you know, still in swift water. It's also around the kind of expertise of some of our officers around protection, identification, and monitoring. We have got good professional staff who are you know, well aware of that and they are an asset to Merseyside and they're also an asset to the UK. Um, and we do emphasise that uh, on every occasion where we are so I'm not protecting the fire and rescue service, the whole time division and the, you know, the, the skills that this service provides in that school. Just to continue with that, is, is there any records anywhere? In relation to when we get these either national or international votes, what the gates are actually called out? Yeah, I mean, those details are available, which, which fire and rescue services are deployed. What you bear in mind is, you know, the basic side fire rescue services get some you know, money uh, from governments to provide some elements of national resilience, not just because we have the staff available and they call when they get it and fund it to. Provide some level of, um, of national response to what the fire rescue services don't. Um, so, you know, clearly, those who are funded to provide the national resilience would more than likely respond to, um, to those kind of national issues. Across the UK, about uh, 19, about 19 are, are, are nationally funded, but they have a different you know, variety of resources as well. So, you know, some of them are in search and rescue, some of them are logistics, some of them have high volume pumps. There are many other different you know, provisions and specialist equipment out there across the UK. Uh, but, but I would say, you know, sometimes not, not only the national resources that are requested and required, and during the flooding in Somerset, uh, a considerable number of fire and rescue services deployed the likes of fire engines to assist in the pumping out of the premises and properties. Uh, as well, so uh, we do come together under adversity to tackle national uh, impact of issues rather than necessarily local specific ones. Jeff, um, going back to Kessel, going into national um, on national occasions, how will that change at the end of this month when West Kirby's book goes? Does, does that change the whole game plan? Or? Uh, uh, I suppose the first instance of it, we're not. There's no guarantee that West Kirby's advice will go with public consultation. It's commenced on the 2nd of March and the extended period of 12 weeks, at which point we felt we'll have to take a decision based on the 
outcome of that consultation as to whether we change our operational uh, resources and assets. Uh, if you know, West Kirby was to close in some way, shape, or form, impact on Hedgewood would, would remain the same. Hedgewood would still be uh, available to respond in terms to Nesting or West Kirby or anywhere else in Merseyside or Cheshire where it was required if it was able to provide the quickest response to a um, house fire or a life risk incident in any of those areas because those 13, 16 arrangements are, you know, are in place to, to facilitate that. Can you accept that recommendation? Thank you. Thank you. Well, then we'll go on to uh, item 6, which is a uh, forward work plan, 129 to 138. Any lead members got anything that they want to bring back to us? Forms. This is the last meeting until after the general election. Any member who's up, best of luck. Drive on.